and turn to the book of Hebrews. Yep, the whole thing. Yeah. We have about seven or eight, sometimes nine Korean students who worship with us from MCI and from Dexter, so we have thought it would be helpful to also put up the Korean verses or the verses in Korean for you. And this morning we have Yunji and Jiyun and Yun Sa with us. On your Pew Bibles, it's found on page 1261. And I'm reading verses 5 through 7. Hear then the word of God. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here am I. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks this morning for your word. And as we come to your word, Father, we pray. We pray that you would prepare our hearts to not only hear it, but to understand it and to do it. We ask for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the poem, the Christmas poem of Clement Moore, correct? Some of you are looking puzzled. You're not familiar with the poem of Clement Moore? Let me read one verse of it and see if it jogs your memory. "'Twas the night before Christmas." Ah, now everybody knows. "'Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. In many homes, the reading of that has become a tradition. I remember when I was a young boy On Christmas Eve, my mother gathering my brothers and my sister and I together, and she would read that to us over a cup of hot chocolate. Perhaps you have similar traditions in your home and certainly perhaps memories of days gone by. I've never tried to memorize it, and my guess is you haven't, but we've heard it so many times, most of us almost know it by heart. So across America, we are beginning to prepare for the celebration of Christmas. Well, most of us. In 1993, an article called Ho, 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 the anti Claus is Coming to Town was published in the Wall Street Journal. The author was Tom Flynn, who was trying to explain a rational, free-thinking kind of way why people should not celebrate Christmas. His article was actually titled Trouble with Christmas. And when it was published in 1993, the media covered it and was covered by all the major networks and Fox News and others. And as a humanist, Flynn urged non-believers, and he was a non-believer himself, self-described, he urged non-believers such as himself to not celebrate Christmas, to ignore Christmas. And his rationale was this. He says, if Jesus is not your savior, Christmas is not your holiday. If Jesus is not your savior, Christmas is not your holiday. When I read that, my mind moved in about two or three different directions. But after thinking about it, I decided that Tom Flynn had a point. After all, Christians believe that 2,000 years ago, something miraculous happened. Something supernatural happened. Something humanly unexplainable happened. We believe, as Christians, 
that God invaded our world, that God took on flesh and was born a babe in Bethlehem. We believe that a long time ago, 2,000 years or so, in a forgot, forgotten part of the Roman Empire, in a tiny village, in an inn that had no room, a baby was born to a frightened young couple who wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a feeding trough. Nothing could have been more obscure. Just another baby Jewish boy. However, as Christians, we believe that he was not just another Jewish baby boy. He was God in the flesh. But what if that's not true? What if there's nothing there behind all the singing and celebrating? What if the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what if they got it wrong? What if Jesus was just another baby? What if the anti clause is right? So this morning I thought we would take a look at Christmas, not from the perspective of Mary and Joseph, not from the perspective of the angels singing, not from the perspective of the shepherds, but from Jesus himself. What was on the Lord's mind as and before he was born? You may be surprised, but the Bible actually gives us an answer to that question. Hebrews 10, 5 through 7, gives us, as it were, a prayer of the baby Jesus as he was preparing to come into the world. This is the Christmas story according to Jesus. In Hebrews 5, 10, 5 through 7, we get the Christmas story from the lips of Jesus. This is what he was thinking about the night before Christmas, 2,000 years ago. Hebrews 10, 5 through 7 is actually quoting Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. If we want to know what Jesus was thinking before he was born, these verses give us a glimpse. Let me read them again. Therefore, as he was coming into the world, he, speaking of Jesus, he said, you did not want sacrifice and offerings, but you prepared a body for me. You did not delight in whole burnt offerings and sin offerings. And then I said, see, it is written about me in the volume of the scroll. I have come to do your will, God. Well, what does Jesus emphasize in these two verses? Three things. First, his existence did not begin at Bethlehem. These verses tell us that the Lord's existence did not begin in the town of David called Bethlehem. Verse 5 stresses the fact that when it attributes the words to, of Jesus as he was coming into the world, they speak to us of the preexistence of Jesus. Our Lord did not begin as it were, at Bethlehem, the second person of the Trinity. That's what Jesus meant when speaking to the Pharisees in John 8. He says, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus was 30-some years old, and he speaks to the Pharisees, and he says, before Abraham was, I am. The I am being a reference to Yahweh. In John's Gospel, John goes back to the real beginning, far beyond, far before Bethlehem, to speak of the preexistence of Christ. And he says, in the beginning was the Word. Talking about the beginning of the world. In the beginning was the Word. The Word 
referring to Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then if you drop down to verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Christmas marks the human birth of the Lord Jesus, the second person of the Godhead. As the Son of God, he existed from all eternity with God the Father. But on Christmas morning, that second person of the Trinity, God the Son, took on flesh. Secondly, he came to take away our sins. He came to replace the Jewish system of sacrifices. Verse 5 of the passage from Hebrews says it rather explicitly, you did not want sacrifice and offerings. Now when the Jewish people real, read that, they must have been shocked because for centuries, Jewish priests were in the habit of daily going into the temple and offering sacrifices. And they sincerely believed that that is what God wanted. What they didn't understand was that the system of sacrifices that God did establish wasn't to be an end unto themselves. The system of sacrifices was to, as it were, paint a picture for them. And the picture that was to be painted was that they had sinned. And there had to be the payment for sin, the shedding of blood. And so the Lord instituted the system of sacrifices, and they were not wrong to celebrate them, but they didn't understand the purpose of them. Listen to what Isaiah writes as he speaks to the Jewish people about their system of sacrifices. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, of fat, of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you? this trampling of my courts. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons and Sabbaths and convocations, I cannot bear your evil assemblies. Your new moon festivals and your appointed feast, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. And when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers with sacrifices, I will not listen. The Jewish people did not understand the purpose of the sacrifices, and God finally says, I'm done with them. So what do all the blood sacrificed by the animals amount to? How many sins could those animal sacrifices forgive? Not one. Not one. Now that may have been shocking to the Jews, but that's exactly what Scripture is telling them. Your sacrifices are meaningless because you don't understand why I gave them to you. I gave them so that you might place your hope in me that I would provide a redeemer for you. A seed born of the woman, Genesis 3.15, who would crush the head of the serpent while the serpent bruised his heel. Jesus came to do away with the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament. He came to deal with our sins once and for all. And so in verse 5 of Hebrew 10s, we read Jesus saying, you prepared a body for me. 
On one level, that means that Christ's birth was no afterthought, but it was God's plan. God's plan from all eternity, Ephesians chapter 1, to send Jesus. On a deeper level, it means that his body was prepared for him so that years later, he could offer himself on the cross as the once-for-all sacrifice for our sins. Jesus came as the babe born in Bethlehem, as the Lamb of God to take away our sins forever. Thirdly, he came to do God's will. When James Montgomery Boyce, pastor at 10th Presbyterian Church, when he preached on this text, he pointed out that Christ came into the world knowing his purpose as a baby from the beginning. That cannot be said of any other baby. When I pray for my grandchildren, I ask God to keep them safe and healthy, and I pray they will grow up to know and to love and serve God. But I don't know what God's plan is for them. I have no idea what God's plan is for them. Each one has a place in God's plan, but I don't know what that is. Five years from now, I won't know what that is. Ten years from now, I won't know what that is. And it's likely I will ever live long enough to see everything God has in store for them. But Jesus was not like that. Even as an infant, he had come for a purpose. It's not a as if the father, when he turned 14, 16, 21, had to talk him into being the sacrifice for our sins. The son knew all along, before his birth, that he was coming as the babe, born in Bethlehem, Christ came to earth for a very specific purpose. The mic has gone out. And that purpose was to bear our sins upon the cross. That's the ultimate angelic proclamation, meaning of the angelic proclamation. For unto us this day is born a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Christ came to die. Nothing else. He came to die. And he perfectly fulfilled God's will when no one else could. Those are the things that were on the mind of Jesus on the night he came born in Bethlehem. Those are the things that Jesus was thinking about as the babe born in Bethlehem. Harry Ironside, a pastor of many years ago, liked to tell the story of Nicholas I, the Tsar of Russia, who ruled 1825 and for about 30 years in Russia. And the Tsar had a good friend, and the good friend of the Tsar had come and said, my son needs a job, can you find my son a job? And the Tsar said, yes, I can find him a job. And he appointed the son as a paymaster for a barracks in one of the Russian army camps. However, it turned out that that son of the friend of the czar was morally weak. And soon, all the money that had been entrusted to him to pay the soldiers in the army, he had gambled away. And when word came that the auditors were coming to the camp to audit his books, the young man despaired, knowing he would be certainly found out. And so he calculated the amount he owed, and the total came to a huge debt, far greater than he could ever pay back. And he determined the night before the auditors arrived that he would take a gun and he would commit suicide before midnight. 
And before going to bed that night, he wrote out a confession listing all that he had stolen, all the ways that he had squandered the money, and the total amount due. And at the end, he said, a great debt, who can pay? And then he fell asleep. Late that night, the czar himself paid a visit to that army camp, and he was going from barracks to barracks, and he noticed a light on in one of the rooms. He peered into the room and found the young man asleep with the letter of confession beside his bed. And he picked up the letter and he read it and instantly understood what had happened. And he paused for a moment, beginning to think about what kind of punishment should be due to this man who has squandered all this money. And so he picked up the piece of paper and after reading it, he wrote one word on the piece of paper and put the paper back down. Eventually, the young man woke up, realizing he had slept past midnight when he had planned to commit suicide. And so he took his gun, preparing to kill himself. But he noticed that someone had moved his piece of paper, and there was something written on the piece of paper. And under his word, that he had written a great debt who can pay, he saw the one word. And the word was Nicholas. And he was dumbfounded and he was terrified when he realized the czar knew what he had done. And checking his records, he found that the signature in his records matched the signature on his note. And finally, the thought settled in his mind that the czar knew the whole story and the czar himself was willing to pay his debt for him. And resting on the words of his commander, he fell asleep. In the morning, a messenger came from the palace of the czar with the exact amount the young man owed. Only the czar could pay, and the czar did pay. Only Jesus can pay your debt to God. No one else can pay your debt. That and that alone explains why the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Because 2,000 years ago, while many were sleeping, God visited the little town of Bethlehem and was born in Bethlehem. And when we look at our sins and realize our hopelessness and we say, a great debt, who can pay? The Lord Jesus steps forwards and takes our ledger and signs at the bottom of our ledger, Jesus Christ. Only Jesus Christ can pay the penalty for your sins. And he does, and he did. That is why he came. That's the real meaning of Christmas. When Christmas arrives, families gather to open gifts, a wonderful tradition. But God has a gift for you. It's not wrapped in bright paper or fancy ribbons. It's wrapped in swaddling clothes and it's lying in the manger. The gift is his son given for you. The Bible says that to all those who want to be a child of God, he receives them unto himself. The key is that you need to invite him to be your savior. And so this Christmas, we ought to reflect once again. Jesus came in the world to be your savior. Have you received the gift? 
Have you said, Jesus, Lord, I am a sinner. I need you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my life, forgive my sins. That's the gift God wants to give to you this Christmas. The answer is, have you received the gift? I'm going to ask Val to put up a prayer on the screen. This is a prayer. There's nothing magical about this prayer. You can use your own words. You can pray whatever prayer you would like to tonight, this morning, but this needs to be the sentiment of your heart. Dear God, I know I am a sinner. I confess that I have sinned in both word and deed today, this morning. I confess my sins and believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and be my Lord and Savior. These things I ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you've never, ever done that, you can do that this morning. If you pray that prayer this morning, share that with me after the service or share it with Andrew, one of the elders. If you're not ready to pray that prayer, that's okay. But go home and think about it. Perhaps tonight before you go to bed, you will pray that prayer. This is what Christmas is all about. This is why Christians celebrate Christmas. If Jesus is not your savior, then Christmas is not your holiday. I pray it is your holiday because Jesus is your Savior. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for coming into the world as the babe born in Bethlehem and willingly taking upon flesh, knowing that one day you would suffer and die, paying the penalty for our sins. Lord Jesus, I pray for those here this morning who don't know you, who don't know you as Lord and Savior, who don't have a relationship with the living God. Move in their hearts, move in their minds. Help them to understand the gift that you are giving them and open their hearts to say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. And for those of us who have prayed that prayer in years past, Father, remind us again this year what Christmas is all about. It's about Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.